This week on the Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. Fuller saw it as his own personal goal to make the world work for 100% of humanity without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. I'm Neil Harvey. Please join us this week for Fireflies, Dumpsters, Soft Power, and the Design Science Revolution on the Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. In 1922, a despondent young man walked the shore of Chicago's Lake Michigan. He'd just lost a daughter and felt responsible. He'd started drinking. He'd been kicked out of Harvard twice, the latter time for irresponsibility and lack of interest. He was bankrupt and jobless. He stared into the water, intending to do away with his presence in the world. Then something happened, a revelation of sorts. He realized that his life was not his own to take away from the world. It was his responsibility to use his life as one humble individual to serve the rest of humanity. This realization catalyzed the rest of his illustrious life. That young man was R. Buckminster Fuller, arguably the greatest visionary designer of the 20th century. His remarkable legacy is inspiring new generations to create the revolution he first called for in 1961. This is a world that works for all. Fireflies, dumpsters, soft power, and the design science revolution with Buckminster Fuller Institute Executive Director Elizabeth Thompson and 2011 semi-finalists for the Buckminster Fuller Challenge Prize, John Adel and Sheila Kennedy. My name is Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. To say Buckminster Fuller was ahead of his time is an understatement. Bucky, as he's commonly known, was a polymath of exceptional scope, an architect, engineer, cartographer, and artist an inventor, futurist, and author of over 30 books. He developed numerous inventions, including the geodesic dome, a structure that covers the most amount of space with the least amount of materials with no visible supports. Scientists later discovered carbon molecules that resembled geodesic domes and named them fullerenes. In the early 1950s, Fuller coined the now familiar phrase spaceship Earth to describe the integral nature of the Earth as a living system. But above all, Bucky was a designer, a pathfinder in whole systems design. Because he believed design is the first signal of human intention, and everything begins with design. He described himself as a comprehensive, anticipatory design scientist. Design science is a framework by which individuals and small groups can design alternative paths for themselves and society as a whole. It doesn't function in this linear fashion when you're really doing it, but it does start with a few kind of fundamental things, one of which is sort of alignment with one's function in the universe, and the second is to articulate as clearly as possible one's vision for the future, unencumbered by what you know can't be done because of the way the world works right now. Fuller called this the preferred state. Elizabeth Thompson is the executive director of the Buckminster Fuller Institute, as well as founding director of the Institute's annual global design competition to find and celebrate integrated solutions that address humanity's most pressing problems. She calls the winning solutions trim tabs, a principle Bucky Fuller loved so much he used it as the epitaph on his tombstone. A trim tab is the tiny mobile tail end of the rudder of a boat or aircraft, so small it seems impossible to have any effect whatsoever, yet if maneuvered just right, it turns the entire ship around with hardly any energy. Sheila Kennedy's portable light project is one such trim tab solution, recognized as a semifinalist of the 2011 Challenge Award. We asked ourselves, what is the smallest, most useful increment of clean energy, and how can we deliver that in an entirely different way and get it out to the largest number of people? Kennedy is a professor of architecture at MIT and a principal of Boston-based Kennedy and Violich Architecture, an interdisciplinary design practice. 
KVA's project was recognized for its elegant innovation inspired by nature's genius, simple and affordable technology with big benefits for people and planet. What, they began by asking, can we learn from the firefly? We look a lot at nature, and the firefly makes his own light. That light is actually produced by nature in the body of the insect, in this case, himself. And so there's no periphery, there's no factories, there's no pollution. This is really clean light. And it's beautiful, and it's an inspiration for this big shift that I think we all feel like we're in now, which is basically a shift in infrastructure. And in the Portable Light Project, in a funny way, although I'm an architect, we're moving away from architecture and asking ourselves, what could this new system be like? How could it be reliable and robust and durable for people who don't have architecture, for people who don't have houses, and who really can't put energy into their house or a solar panel on their roof because they don't have a roof? And there are a lot of them. So we're thinking about how we can think about something that's autonomous, that can be carried with the person, very much like the firefly, something that's self-sufficient. And also, of course, something that would be lightweight and adaptable and, and maybe even familiar that would touch on people's already known cultures. We actually started to think, what if textiles could harvest energy from sunlight? You know, what if that could actually happen? And that would be very different than how most photovoltaic panels are made. The Portable Light Team made contact with the Huichol people of rural Mexico through anthropologist Dr. Stacy Schaefer. Dr. Schaefer was an apprentice to the Huichol's thousand-year-old tradition of backstrap weaving. The team introduced the weavers to a simple kit of solar electric parts. They adapted the modern kit to an ancient textile design, inventing a brand-new hybrid portable lighting product. You can sort of think about it as a geode-like structure, although that's a, a kind of hard rock structure. But in that analogy, a geode, when you see it on the ground, is just a kind of a brown rock. It doesn't really look out of the ordinary. But of course, when you break it open, you see that there's an incredible crystalline structure inside. And so we're interested in having the solar panels be part of a fabric so in some instances, this is a, a wool bag, a kind of a natural brown and white bag that's fairly typical for the Weichol people, at least older people still make bags that way. And the solar panels are then attached onto that bag, and they fit really well onto the bag. And then we have pockets on the inside. And the geode, or the kind of transformative effect, is that the inside liner of the bag kind of gets pulled out. And we've developed ways that a flat textile can fold and come to form. We call that flat to form. And so you can actually like pop up a lantern shape, turn on the LED, and then you have that impression that you have that glowing autonomous surface. And so you've been walking around. You've spent maybe six hours outside. You have a fully charged battery, and you have light. These portable lights protect the Paso del Istmo biological corridor in Nicaragua. Local rangers shine a light on beaches to prevent the poaching of sea turtle eggs. During the daytime, the flexible solar materials harvest energy. At night, the LED light can even switch from white to red so that rangers can patrol the beaches without disturbing the sea turtles. In the remote regions of Haiti, where there's no electricity or running water, the NGO Maison de Naissance instituted a network of traveling midwives who bicycle the countryside to provide prenatal care. They carry a renewable light and power source on their medical bags that provides enough light for nighttime emergency procedures and that can charge cell phones and electronic medical devices through a USB connection. Design scientists also saw a solution waiting to happen in South Africa where everyone can send or receive free text messages. But what kind of messages would benefit the people most? The iTeach program is a program that addresses the needs of people who, many of them live in very rural areas, who have the co-epidemic of HIV and multidrug-resistant TB, which is a very serious epidemic. And because the TB is multidrug-resistant, these people have to go through very long medications, one medication after another. And essentially what happens is they lose hope. 
and they stop taking their medications, and then that doesn't cure their TB, and they're at risk for spreading that to people who've been taking care of them, their family members, and other people in the the community. And so it was iTeach's innovation to try to take advantage, to amortize, as I like to think of it, the cell phone texting capabilities in South Africa. Here, portable light takes the form of a blanket that patients can take outside, wrap around their shoulders, and literally empower themselves. It provides a lifeline, 24-7 clean energy for light and for charging their cell phones. And people will look at their cell phone, get a message, get a reminder, hear the voice of someone that they respect in their community, reminding them and giving them a little bit more hope. The Portable Light Team has piloted its innovations in four developing countries. Now the Rocky Mountain Institute, the leading U.S. think-and-do tank for renewable energy, is collaborating with them to bring the project to scale. So we asked ourselves, how could what we had learned about mobility, about convergence, and about flexible solar integration, how could that be applied in a kind of a familiar middle America context? And... Very briefly, we realized that there were probably at least three obstacles that kept people from really taking advantage of photovoltaics. Problem number one, installation. Putting solar panels on your roof is about a third of the total cost of a solar electric system. So what if they weren't on the roof? Problem two, rooftop solar panels produce DC power, but everything under the roof runs on AC. Plus, it's inefficient to invert DC current to AC current. What if you didn't have to invert it? The third problem is that not everyone loves the look of rooftop solar. What if solar collectors didn't have to be up there? Sheila Kennedy and her team of design scientists saw these obstacles as trim tabs, little levers that could turn the whole problem of domestic electricity around by rethinking where and how energy can best be created in the home. And so we thought, well, what if we could give another job to household curtains? They could provide shading, which is great. They can provide insulation, which is also great, just like they've done for centuries. But they could also harvest energy. That would be great. So we then were launched in a direction which was counterintuitive because most people think that panels need to be horizontal and so forth, but we looked at incident light in the United States and so forth, and we concluded that about half of the electrical power that's typically consumed for an American household could be offloaded to the curtains. But we would have to scale the power that was created by curtains to do certain specific jobs. So, you know, you've heard of a hybrid car. This is a little bit like a hybrid house. So the curtains would do the job that is best done by DC electricity. They would power laptops. They would power lighting solid-state lighting. They would power PDAs, cell phones, cameras, all of those portable work tools that people use that are are DC-powered. And on a, a laptop like this, when I plug that into the wall, my power supply gets hot, and there's a, a lot of wasted energy with uh, millions of laptops in use because we're trying to take the AC from the wall and run a DC battery with that. So forget that. We said we're going to have a curtain do another job, and we're going to have the track system be the distributor for the DC power, the curtain track. So two very old ideas just given new jobs. And from that really was born the soft house. Sheila Kennedy's soft house reinvents the boundaries between traditional walls and electric utilities. The result is a building that creates its own power. Call it soft power a living space with organic photovoltaic curtains that move to follow the sun and can generate up to 16,000 watt-hours of electricity, more than half the daily power needs of an average American household. The Softhouse Project won the International Building Exhibition Competition, and the first will be built in Hamburg, Germany. When we return, more comprehensive anticipatory design solutions to create the preferred state for Spaceship Earth. This is a world that works for all. Fireflies, dumpsters, soft power, and the design science revolution. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature.
Bioneer's Revolution from the Heart of Nature is made possible in part by John Masters Organics. Feel good about looking good. Learn more at johnmasters.com. Free distribution of this program is made possible in part by support from listeners like you. To explore more Bioneer's radio shows and conference videos for free, visit Bioneers.org. One of the greatest virtues of whole systems design that Bucky Fuller championed is a concept that's become well-known, synergy. The idea that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Magic happens when you put the right pieces together with an elegant design. Dynamic elements feed each other to create something far greater and even more valuable and new. Again, Elizabeth Thompson, Executive Director of the Buckminster Fuller Institute. Buckminster Fuller talked singularly about synergy and the important principle found in nature of synergy, of what happens when people come together and collaborate and cooperate. Uh, You know, as usual, Fuller saw what's the sort of great disruption coming a long time ago, and he called for a design science revolution in 1961. To do this, he argued that we as it says in this quote, that we never change things by fighting the existing reality, but to change something, we must build new models to make the old ones obsolete. The way we're doing things right now with our food system is not working. It's not a sustainable way of producing food. In Chicago, the average vegetable has traveled about 1,500 miles to our plates. So something is clearly wrong here. John Adel is building a new model that's making the old ones obsolete. As director of the Chicago Sustainable Manufacturing Center, a green business incubator, his current project is to repurpose a vacant meatpacking facility into a net-zero energy vertical farm called The Plant. Adel plans to create 125 jobs in Chicago's economically distressed back-of-the-yards neighborhood while diverting over 10,000 tons of food waste from landfills each year to meet all the project's heat and power needs, its synergy in action. The concept of the vertical farm is this beautiful, sexy skyscraper, glass skyscraper, which does not work. It's a dysfunctional concept in its entirety. And basically, if you get enough energy in through the glazing to grow the plants, you're also losing that much energy out through the glazing. And so the way that we're approaching this is to, first off, reduce by reusing existing structures and not spending $750 or $1,000 a square foot to construct a glass skyscraper. I bought the Pure Foods meat packing plant for $5.50 a square foot. So that's our baseline starting point. You can get industrial facilities for that little. Adel has retrofitted his 93,000-square-foot, four-story red brick building with energy-efficient windows that let the sun shine in. But surprisingly, his aquaponic growing systems mostly don't use it. We're not using natural light, except in our greenhouses on the roof, which are more like normal greenhouses. Then you have the ability to grow at night. In our case, we're building an anaerobic digester, which makes it a little bit moot. But if you're on the grid it makes more sense to grow at night when electricity is much, much cheaper because they can't slow down the power plants at night, but the consumption slows down. The other reason that we grow entirely under artificial light is that we can insulate the facility really, really well and capture all of the waste heat from the electricity. The other big thing that we're doing is combining the growing with something else. And so we're collecting that waste oxygen, and right now it's supplying the kombucha brewer, and he's supplying us with carbon dioxide in a very simple, fan-driven kind of a way. John Adel says the plant is all about closing the food waste loop by feeding spent grains from the brewery to the tilapia in the aquaponic system, while solids from the tilapia waste will be fed to the mushroom farm, closing the energy loop by interconnecting with neighborhood businesses going beyond current energy efficiency certifications, a whole greater than the sum of the parts, all the way to net zero energy consumption. The way we're going to do it is by slurping up 32 tons a day, every day, of food waste from our neighbors. We're surrounded by food manufacturing companies. As a matter of fact, we have a brewery moving into the plant, 20,000 square feet worth, which will produce a significant amount of waste. And so using an anaerobic digester, 
making biogas, burning it in a turbine, which actually happens to be a recycled military fighter jet engine, swords to plowshares here, uh, with phase-synchronized generating equipment attached to it. We're going to capture every scrap of waste heat from that turbine, capture the electricity, obviously, to power the lights and the blowers in the building, use the exhaust to power an absorption chiller, which will give us a blend of hot and cold. Depending on the season, we can blend back and forth smoothly. And then the heat, we're, we're going to use every scrap of that heat. And then, by the way, the byproduct of burning biogas is pretty pure carbon dioxide, which our plants happen to need enormous quantities of. Basically, the plant is all about closing loops, closing energy loops, closing waste loops, closing gases, everything we can. And so we're selecting tenants based on their inputs and outputs. And so kitchens and brewing are very inefficient activities, very, very inefficient And so if we can do some of the more inefficient activities in a facility and get to net zero, then the rest of the development world doesn't have a whole lot in the way of excuses left, do they? The plant will be an off-grid powerhouse, creating all the electrical energy, heating, and cooling needed by its beer brewery, bakery, kombucha brewery, mushroom farm, and commercial kitchens. Adel's enthusiasm for this self-sustaining, interconnected business model provides the vital energy for these businesses to grow and prosper together while creating new, green jobs in a struggling community. Talk about a preferred state. Incubating small food businesses is very important because not only are we going to be growing food, but we want very much to be making jobs in our community. Back of the yards is an economically blighted, distressed area. All the jobs are gone, and there's a skilled workforce within walking distance of the plant. So we're hoping to give people a leg up and make it as cheap as possible for them to rent a certified, licensed, inspected kitchen space to get their food business going. That's great. Because there's a lot of will out there. There's a lot of people that want to do that. And it's very difficult, especially in Chicago with our previous political climate, for a very small business to do anything without being just mutilated by city government. And so that's starting to turn around. But we're trying to make it as easy as possible, including shared offices so that tenants can talk to each other. Who's in, you know, whose insurance do you have? What do you do about this, this, and the other thing? Who's your suppliers? According to John Adel, A truly sustainable business model includes the free flow of information and knowledge so that others can adapt it and replicate it elsewhere. He plans to freely teach whatever he learns in the grand experiment of the plant. He's committed to helping seed the flourishing of urban agriculture and all its benefits, including good green jobs and businesses. When you set the bar high which we did. I don't know how to do this stuff. You know, I don't have a clue how these things work. But if you say, this is what I want to achieve, then the people that do, the engineers and the architects and the laborers and the pipe fitters and everybody that you need say, wow, that's what we should be doing. And they come and they help. And so, you know, you don't need to know personally how to get to the end of the road on this. You just need to lay out what you think the ideal is, and then you will get there. So, thanks. John Adel of Plant Chicago, a 2011 Buckminster Fuller Challenge semi-finalist project. As Buckminster Fuller Institute Director Elizabeth Thompson observes, Bucky had a very particular vision of how we can reach the preferred state. One of the things that I also think was inspiring about how Fuller framed the agency of the individual was he didn't use words like an ambassador of a cause or an activist or an advocate. He used words like designer. He saw that everybody was a designer. That is a word that doesn't describe an activity. It is in itself activating. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in some of the projects that we have in the pipeline is to create opportunities for individuals to reframe how they think about themselves, reframe their own agency in terms of design. Because if you just do that thought experiment with yourself for 20 seconds and you start to imagine yourself as a designer, you open your eyes and think, oh, okay, well, I can solve that problem because I'm a designer now and I have the capacity to figure it out. Bucky Fuller asked, 
If success or failure of this planet and of human beings depended on how I am and what I do, how would I be and what would I do? How would you be? What would you do? A world that works for all. Fireflies, dumpsters, soft power, and the design science revolution. You can listen to a variety of Bioneers radio shows and view conference videos online at Bioneers.org, where you can also learn about attending the National Bioneers Conference or a local Bioneers Conference near you. The Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Ausubel. Written by Catherine Stifter and Kenny Ausubel. Senior producer, Neil Harvey. Managing producer, Stephanie Welch. Production management, Aaron Leventman and Nicole Spangenberg. Interview recording engineer, Jeff Westman. Our theme music is taken from the album Journey Between by Baca Beyond and used by permission of Hannibal Records, a Ryko Disc label. Additional music was made available by Jamie Sieber at J-A-M-I-S-I-E-B-E-R dot com. For more music information, please visit Bioneers.org. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature radio series are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join the Bioneers in inspiring a shift to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. This is program number 0312. This series is made possible by Organic Valley Family of Farms, organic and family-owned since 1988. Learn more at organicvalley.coop. And by Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. For more information, visit www.bioneers.org or call one 877 Bioneer.